He delights to be proved, Malachi 3 verse 10. Oft he permits just such a trial as now face David in order to teach us more fully his sufficiency for every emergency. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Yes, this is blessed indeed. David did not storm at his men and denounce them as cowards. That would do no good. Nor did he argue and attempt to reason with them, disdaining his own wisdom, feeling his utter dependency upon God, and more especially for their benefit, to set before them a godly. Example, he turned once more unto Jehovah. Let us learn from this incident that the most effectual way of answering the unbelieving objections of faint-hearted followers and of securing their cooperation is to refer them unto the promises and precepts of God and set before them an example of complete dependency upon him and of implicit confidence in him. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand, thee four. How sure is the fulfillment of that promise? Them that honor me, I will honor. 1 Samuel 2 verse 30. We always lose by acting independently of God, but we never lose by seeking counsel, guidance, and grace from him. God did not ignore David's inquiry. He was not displeased by his asking a second time. How gracious and patient he is. He not only responded to David's petition, but he gave an answer more explicit than at the first, for he now assured his servant of entire victory. May this encourage many a reader to come unto God with every difficulty, cast every care upon him, and count upon his succor every hour. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah v. 5. Animated by a commission and promise from God, David and his men moved forward and attacked the Philistines. Not only did they completely rout the enemy, but they captured their cattle, which supplied food for David's men, food which the men greatly needed. How this furnishes. An illustration of him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, Ephesians 3 verse 20. God not only overthrew the Philistines and delivered Keilah, but as well, bountifully provided David's army with a supply of provisions. And it came to pass, when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand, v. 6. This was a further reward from the Lord unto David for obeying his word. As we shall see later, the presence of the high priest and his ephod with him stood David in good stead in the future. We may also see here a striking example of the absolute control of God over all his creatures. It was David's visit to Ahimelech that had resulted in the slaying of all his family. Well then might the only son left. Feel that the son of Jesse was the last man whose fortunes he desired to share. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is. Shut in, by entering into a town that hath gates and bars, v. 7. Surely David's signal victory over the common enemy should have reconciled Saul to him. Was it not abundantly clear that God was with him? And if he were with him, who could be against him? But one who is abandoned by the Lord can neither discern spiritual things nor judge righteously and therefore his conduct will be all wrong too. Accordingly, we find that instead of thinking how he might most suitably reward David for his courageous and unselfish generosity, Saul desired only to do him mischief. Well, might our patriarch write, they rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul. Psalms 35 verse 12. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. How easy it is for a jaundiced mind to view things in a false light. When the heart is wrong, the providences of God are certain to be misinterpreted. Terrible is it to behold the apostate king here concluding that God himself had now sold David into his hands. That man has sunk to a fearful depth who blatantly assumes that the Almighty is working to further his wicked plans. While David was at large, hiding in caves and sheltering in the woods, he was hard to find. But here in a walled town, Saul supposed he would be completely trapped when his army surrounded it. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men, v. 8. 
If we omit the last clause and read on through the next verse, it will be seen that the unscrupulous Saul resorted to a dishonest ruse. To make war against the Philistines was the ostensible object which the king set before his men. To capture David was his real design. The last clause of verse 8 states Saul's secret motive. While pretending to oppose the common enemy, he was intending to destroy his best friend. Verily, the devil was his father, and the lusts of his father he would do. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar, the priest, Bring hither the Ephod v. 9 Yes, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, Psalms 25 verse 14. Ah, uh, but only with them that truly fear him. If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, John 11, verse 9. He that followeth me, said Christ, shall not walk in darkness, John 8, verse 12. Oh, what a blessed thing it is, dear reader, to have light upon our path, to see the enemy's snares and pitfalls. But in order to this, there must be a walking with him who is the light. If we are out of communion with the Lord, if we have for the moment turned aside from the path of his commandments, then we can no longer perceive the dangers which menace us. First Samuel A. 2 Classic Bible Study Guide 1.
and David. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again, v4. This is precious. David did not allow the unbelieving fears of his men to drive him to despair. He could hardly expect them to walk by his faith. But he knew that when God works, he works at both ends of the line. He who had given him orders to go to the relief of Gila, could easily quiet the hearts of his followers, remove their fears, and make them willing to follow his lead. Yes, with God all things are possible. But he requires to be inquired of, Isaac 36 37. He delights to be proved, MAL 310. Oft he permits just such a trial as now faced David in order to teach us more fully his sufficiency for every emergency. Then David inquired of the Lord yet again. Yes, this is blessed indeed. David did not storm at his men, and denounce them as cowards. That would do no good. Nor did he argue and attempt to reason with them. Disdaining his own wisdom, feeling his utter dependency upon God, and more especially for their benefit to set before them a godly example he turned once more unto Jehovah. Let us learn from this incident that, the most effectual way of answering the unbelieving objections of faint-hearted followers and of securing their cooperation, is to refer them unto the promises and precepts of God, and set before them an example of complete dependency upon him and of implicit confidence in him. And the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand, v4. How sure is the fulfillment of that promise, them that honor me, I will honor, 1 Sam 2.30. We always lose by acting independently of God, but we never lose by seeking counsel, guidance, and grace from him. God did not ignore David's inquiry. He was not displeased by his asking a second time. How gracious and patient he is. He not only responded to David's petition, but he gave an answer more explicit than at the first, for he now assured his servant of entire victory. May this encourage many a reader to come unto God with every difficulty, cast every care upon him, and count upon his succor every hour. So David and his men went to Keilah, and fought with the Philistines, and brought away their cattle, and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Gila, v5. Animated by a commission and promise from God, David and his men moved forward and attacked the Philistines. Not only did they completely rout the enemy, but they captured their cattle, which supplied food for David's men, food which the men greatly needed. How this furnishes an illustration of him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, F320. God not only overthrew the Philistines and delivered Gila, but as well, bountifully provided David's army with a supply of provisions. And it came to pass, when Abiathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David to Gila, that he came down with an ephod in his hand, v6. This was a further reward from the Lord unto David for obeying his word. As we shall see later, the presence of the high priest and his ephod with him, stood David in good stead in the future. We may also see here a striking example of the absolute control of God over all his creatures, it was David's visit to Ahimelech that had resulted in the slaying of all his family, well then might the only son left, feel that the son of Jesse was the last man whose fortunes he desired to share. And it was told Saul that David was come to Keilah. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in, by entering into a town that hath gates and bars, v7. Surely David's signal victory over the common enemy should have reconciled Saul to him. Was it not abundantly clear that God was with him, and if he were with him, who could be against him? But one who is abandoned by the Lord can neither discern spiritual things nor judge righteously, and therefore his conduct will be all wrong too. Accordingly we find that instead of thinking how he might most suitably reward David for his courageous and unselfish generosity, Saul desired only to do him mischief. Well might our patriarch write, they rewarded me evil for good to the spoiling of my soul, PS 35 colon 12. And Saul said, God hath delivered him into mine hand, for he is shut in, 
by entering into a town that had gates and bars. How easy it is for a jaundiced mind to view things in a false light. When the heart is wrong, the providences of God are certain to be misinterpreted. Terrible is it to behold the apostate king here concluding that God himself had now sold David into his hands. That man has sunk to a fearful depth who blatantly assumes that the Almighty is working to further his wicked plans. While David was at large, hiding in caves and sheltering in the woods, he was hard to find, but here in a walled town, Saul supposed he would be completely trapped when his army surrounded it. And Saul called all the people together to war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men, B.A. If we omit the last clause and read on through the next verse, it will be seen that the unscrupulous Saul resorted to a dishonest ruse. To make war against the Philistines was the ostensible object which the king set before his men, to capture David was his real design. The last clause of verse 8 states Saul's secret motive. While pretending to oppose the common enemy, he was intending to destroy his best friend. Verily, the devil was his father, and the lusts of his father he would do. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar, the priest, bring hither the ephod, v9. Yes, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, ps 25 colon 14. Ah, but only with them that truly fear him. If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, John 11 colon 9. He that followeth me, said Christ, shall not walk in darkness, John 8 12. Oh what a blessed thing it is, dear reader, to have light upon our path, to see the enemy's snares and pitfalls. But in order to this, there must be a walking with him who is the light. If we are out of communion with the Lord, if we have for the moment turned aside from the path of his commandments, then we can no longer perceive the dangers which menace us. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. This is very blessed, and recorded for our instruction. We ought not to be ignorant of Satan's devices, 2 COR 2.11, nor shall we be if our hearts are right with God. Observe carefully that this ninth verse opens with the word and, which announces the fact that it is connected with and gives the sequel to what has gone before. And what had preceded in this case. First, David had sought counsel of the Lord, v2. Second, he had refused to be turned aside from the path of duty by the unbelieving fears of his followers, v3. Third, he had maintained an attitude of complete dependency upon the Lord, v4. Fourth, he had definitely obeyed the Lord, v5. And now God rewarded him by acquainting him with the enemy's designs upon him. Meet the conditions, my brother, or sister, and you too shall know when the devil is about to attack you. David was not deceived by Saul's guile. He knew that though he had given out to his men one thing, yet in his heart he purposed quite another. Then said David, O Lord God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seek to come to Keilah, to destroy the city for my sake, v10. This too is very blessed, once more David thus turns to the living God, and casts all his care upon him, 1 Peter 5 colon 7. Observe well his words, he does not say Saul purposeth to slay me, but he seek to destroy the city for my sake, on my account. Is it not lovely to see him more solicitous about the welfare of others, than the preserving of his own life? Will the men of Gila deliver me up into his hands? Will Saul come down, as thy servant hath heard? O Lord God of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down, v11. It is to be noted that the two questions here asked by David were not orderly put, showing the perturbed state of mind he was then in. We should also observe the manner in which David addressed God, as Lord God of Israel, so too in verse 10, which was his covenant title. It is blessed when we are able to realize the covenant relationship of God to us, Hebrew 13 20, 21 for it is ever an effectual plea to present before the throne of grace. The Lord graciously responded to David's supplication and granted the desired information, reversing the order of his questions. God saying he, Saul, will come down, 
that is his purpose, here manifested his omniscience, for he knows all contingencies, possibilities and likelihoods, as well as actualities. Then said David, Will the men of Hela deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? B.12 Wise David, he had good cause to conclude that after so nobly befriending Gila and delivering it from the Philistines, that its citizens would now further his interests, and in such case, he and his own men could defend the town against Saul's attack. But he prudently refrained from placing any confidence in their loyalty. He probably reasoned that the recent cruel massacre of Nob would fill them with dread of Saul, so that he must not count upon their assistance. Thus did he seek counsel from the Lord. And so ought we, we should never confide in help from others, no, not even from those we have befriended, and from whom we might reasonably expect a return of kindness. No ties of honor, gratitude, or affection, can secure the heart under powerful temptation. Nay, we know not how we would act if assailed by the terrors of a cruel death, and left without the immediate support of divine grace. We are to depend only upon the Lord for guidance and protection. And the Lord said, They will deliver thee up, v12. This must have been saddening to David's heart, for base ingratitude wounds deeply. Yet let us not forget that the kindness of other friends whom the Lord often unexpectedly raises up, counterbalances the ingratitude and fickleness of those we have served. God answered David here according to his knowledge of the human heart. Had David remained in Gila, its inhabitants would have delivered him up upon Saul's demand. But he remained not, and escaped. Be it carefully noted that this incident furnishes a clear illustration of human responsibility, and is a strong case in point against bald fatalism taking the passive attitude that what is to be, must be. Then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Gila, and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Gila, and he forbore to go forth. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand, verses 13, 14. This too is blessed. David was willing to expose himself and his men to further hardships, rather than endanger the lives of Gila. Having no particular place in view, they went forth wherever they thought best. The last half of verse 14 shows God's protecting hand was still upon them, and is Jehovah's reply to Saul's vain and presumptuous confidence in verse 7. The Life of David, A. W. Pink since we have no priestly ephod to direct us how are we convicted to know his plan for our life. PROV 3 colon 5 1 Samuel 23 colon 14 dash 29 Many are the afflictions of the righteous, PS 34 colon 19 Some internal, others external, some from friends, others from foes, some more directly at the hand of God, others more remotely by the instrumentality of the devil nor should this be thought strange. Such has been the lot of all God's children in greater or lesser degree. Nor ought we to expect much comfort in a world which so basely crucified the Lord of glory. The sooner the Christian makes it his daily study to pass through this world as a stranger and pilgrim, anxious to depart and be with Christ, the better for his peace of mind. But it is natural to cling tenaciously to this life and to love the things of time and sense, and therefore most of the Lord's people have to encounter many buffetings and have many disappointments before they are brought to hold temporal things with a light hand and before their silly hearts are weaned from that which satisfies not. There is scarcely any affliction which besets the suffering people of God that the subject of these chapters did not experience. David, in the different periods of his varied life, was placed in almost every situation in which a believer, be he rich or poor in this world's goods, can be placed. This is one feature which makes the study of his life of such practical interest unto us today. And this also it was which experimentally fitted him to write so many psalms, which the saints of all ages have found so perfectly suited to express unto God the varied feelings of their souls. No matter whether the heart be cast down by the bitterest grief, or whether it be exultant with overflowing joy. Nowhere can we find language more appropriate to use in our approaches unto the majesty on high, 
than in the recorded sobs and songs of him who tasted the bitters of cruel treatment and base betrayals, and the sweetness of human success and spiritual communion with the Lord, as few have done. Oftentimes the providences of God seem profoundly mysterious to our dull perceptions, and strange unto us do appear the schoolings through which he passes his servants, nevertheless faith is assured that omniscience makes no mistakes, and he who is love causes none of his children a needless fear. Beautifully did C. H. Spurgeon introduce his exposition of Psalm 59 by saying, Strange that the painful events in David's life should end in enriching the repertoire of the national minstrelsy, group of songs or verse. Out of a sour, ungenerous soil spring up the honey-bearing flowers of psalmody. Had he never been cruelly hunted by Saul, Israel, and the Church of God in after ages would have missed this song. The music of the sanctuary is in no small degree indebted to the trials of the saints. Affliction is the tuner of the harps of sanctified songsters. Let every troubled reader seek to lay this truth to heart and take courage. And David abode in the wilderness in strongholds, and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. And Saul sought him every day but God delivered him not into his hand. 1 Sam 23 14 It is blessed to behold David's self-restraint under sore provocation. Though perfectly innocent, so far as his conduct toward Saul was concerned, that wicked king continued to hound him without any rest. David had conducted himself honorably in every public station he filled, and now he has to suffer disgrace in the eyes of the people as a hunted outlaw. Great must have been the temptation to put an end to Saul's persecution by the use of force. He was a skilled leader, had 600 men under him, B13, and he might easily have employed strategy, lured his enemy into a trap, fallen upon and slain him. Instead, he possessed his soul in patience, walked in God's ways, and waited God's time. And the Lord honored this as the sequel shows. Ah, dear reader, it is written, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city, PROV 1632. Oh for more godly self-control, for this we should pray earnestly and often. Are you, like David was, sorely oppressed? Are you receiving evil at the hands of those from whom you might well expect good? Is there some Saul mercilessly persecuting you? Then no doubt you too are tempted to take things into your own hands, perhaps have recourse to the law of the land. But O oh tried one, suffer us to gently remind you that it is written, Avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore if thine enemy hunger, feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, ROM 12 19, 20. Remember too the example left us by the Lord Jesus, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, 1 Peter 2 23. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood, v 15. How this illustrates what we are told in Galatians 4.29, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. And let us not miss the deeper spiritual meaning of this, the opposition which Isaac encountered from Ishmael adumbrated the lustings of the flesh against the spirit. There is a continual warfare within every real Christian between the principle of sin and the principle of grace, commonly termed the two natures. There is a spiritual Saul who is constantly seeking the life of a spiritual David, it is the old man with his affections and appetites, seeking to slay the new man. Against his relentless attacks we need ever to be on our guard. And David saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood. Ziph derived its name from a city in the tribe of Judah, Joshua 15:25. It is surely significant that Ziph signifies a refining place, possibly the mountain there, V14, was rich in minerals, and at Ziph there was a smelter and refinery. Be this as it may, the spiritual lesson is here written too plainly for us to miss. The hard knocks which the saint receives from a hostile world, the persecutions he endures at the hands of those who hate God, the trials through which he passes in the scene of sin, may, and should be, 
improved to the good of his soul. Oh may many of the Lord's people prove that these hard times through which they are passing are a refining place for their faith and other spiritual graces. And Jonathan, Saul's son arose, and went to David into the wood, and strengthened his hand in God. And he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and I shall be next unto thee, and that also Saul my father knoweth. And they two made a covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house, verses 16 to 18. These verses record the final meeting on earth between David and the weak, vacillating Jonathan. Attached to David as he was by a strong natural affection, yet he lacked grace to throw in his lot with the hunted fugitive. He refused to join with his father in persecuting David, yet the pull of the palace and the court was too strong to be resisted. He stands as a solemn example of the spiritual compromiser, of the man who is naturally attracted to Christ, but lacks a supernatural knowledge of him which leads to full surrender to him. That he strengthened David's hand in God no more evidenced him to be a regenerate man, than do the words of Saul in verse 21. Instead of his words in verse 17 coming true, he fell by the sword of the Philistines on Gilboa. Then came up the Ziphites to Saul to Jibia, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hachilah, which is on the south of Shimon? Now therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Verses 19, 20. Alas, what is man, and how little to be depended upon? Here was David seeking shelter from his murderous foe, and that among the people of his own tribe, and there were they, in order to curry favor with Saul, anxious to betray him into the king's hands. It was a gross breach of hospitality, and there was no excuse for it, for Saul had not sought unto nor threatened them. It mattered not to them though innocent blood were shed, so long as they procured the smile of the apostate monarch. That day alone will show how many have fallen victims before those who cared for nothing better than the favor of those in authority. And Saul said, Blessed be ye of the Lord, for ye have compassion on me. Be 21. Thankfully did Saul receive the offer of these treacherous miscreants. Observe well how he used the language of piety while bent on committing the foulest crime. O oh my reader, for your own good we beg you to take heed unto this require something more than fair words, or even religious phrases, before you form a judgment of another, and still more so before you place yourself in his power. Promises are easily made, and easily broken by most people. The name of God is glibly taken upon the lips of multitudes who have no fear of God in their hearts. Know too how the wretched Saul represented himself to be the aggrieved one, and construes the perfidy of the Ziphites as their loyalty to the king. Go, I pray you, prepare yet, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who hath seen him there, for it is told me that he dealeth very subtly. See therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hideth himself, and come yet again to me with the certainty and I will go with you, and it shall come to pass, if he be in the land, that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah, verses 22, 23. Before he journeyed to Ziph, Saul desired more specific information as to exactly where David was now located. He knew that the man he was after had a much better acquaintance than his own of that section of the country. He knew that David was a clever strategist, perhaps he had fortified some place, and the king wished for details, so that he might know how large a force would be needed to surround and capture David and his men. Apparently Saul felt so sure of his prey he considered there was no need for hurried action. Then news that the Ziphites had proved unfaithful reached the ears of David, and though the king's delay gave him time to retreat to the wilderness of Mon, v. 24, yet he was now in a sore plight. His situation was desperate, and none but an almighty hand could deliver him. Blessed is it to see him turning at this time unto the living God and spreading his urgent case before him. It was then that he prayed the prayer which is recorded in Psalm 54, the superscription of which reads a Psalm of David, when the Ziphites came and said to Saul, 
Doth not David hide himself with us? In it we are given to hear him pouring out his heart unto the Lord, and unto it we now turn to consider a few of its details. Save me, O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. PS 54 colon 1. David was in a position where he was beyond the reach of human assistance, only a miracle could now save him, therefore did he supplicate the miracle working God. Without any preamble, David went straight to the point and cried, Save me, O God. Kilo would not shelter him, the Ziphites had basely betrayed him, Saul and his men thirsted for his blood. Other refuge there was none, God alone could help him. His appeal was to his glorious name, which stands for the sum of all his blessed attributes, and to his righteousness judge me by thy strength. This signifies, secure justice for me, for none else will give it me. This manifested the innocency of his cause. Only when our case is pure can we call upon the power of divine justice to vindicate us. Hear my prayer, O God, give ear to the words of my mouth. PS 54 colon 2 How we need to remember and turn unto the Lord when enduring the contradiction of sinners against ourselves, to look above and draw strength from God, so that we be not weary and faint in our minds. Well did C.H. Spurgeon write, as long as God hath an open ear we cannot be shut up in trouble. All other weapons may be useless, but all prayer is ever more available. No enemy can spike this gun. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppressors seek after my soul, they have not set God before them. Selah, PS 54 colon 3 Those who had no acquaintance with David, and so could have no cause for ill will against him, were his persecutors, strangers were they to God. In such a circumstance it is well for us to plead before God that we are being hated for his sake. We must not here expound the remainder of this psalm. But let us note three other things in it. First, the marked change in the last four verses, following the Selah at the end of verse 3. On that word Selah Spurgeon wrote, as if he said, enough of this, let us pause. He is out of breath with indignation. A sense of wrong bids him suspend the music a while. It may also be observed, that more pauses would, as a rule, improve our devotions, we are usually too much in a hurry. Second, his firm confidence in God and the assurance that his request would be granted, this appears in verses 4 to 6, particularly in that he shall reward evil unto mine enemies the cut them off was not spoken in hot revenge, but as an amen to the sure sentence of the just judge. Third, his absolute confidence that his prayer was answered, the hath delivered me of verse 7 is very striking, and with it should be carefully compared and pondered, Mark 11:24. It now remains for us to observe how God answered David's prayer. And they arose, and went to Ziph before Saul, but David and his men were in the wilderness of Mon, in the plain of the south of Shimon, B24. The term wilderness is rather misleading to English heirs, it is not synonymous with desert, but is in contrast from cultivated farmlands and orchards, often signifying a wild forest. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Mon. And Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David, and his men on that side of the mountain, and David made haste to get away for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them verses 25 26 how often is such the case with us some sore trial presses and we cry unto god for relief but before his answer comes matters appear to get worse ah that is in order that his hand may be the more evident david's plight was now a serious one for saul and his men had practically enveloped them and only a mountain or more accurately a steep cliff separated them Escape seemed quite cut off, outnumbered, surrounded, further flight was out of the question. At last Saul's evil object appeared to be on the very point of attainment. 